Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, The Wilder Historian, and this is part two of my reaction to the movie Lincoln, directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Daniel Day-Lewis. Although I'm disgusted by slavery, I rise on this sad and solemn day to announce that I'm opposed to the amendment. We must consider what will become of colored folk if four million are in one instant set free. They'll be free, George. That's what will become of them. We will be forced to enfranchise the men of the colored race. It would be inhuman not to. Now, who among us is prepared to give Negroes the vote. No. And, and what shall follow upon that? Universal enfranchisement? No. Votes for women? No. Although this scene and others like it within the film could be written off as boring 19th century politics, this movie uses speeches of various politicians to demonstrate the divisiveness that emancipation and equality had within Congress, the North, and the country at large. The South accused the North of being abolitionists, but in reality, a true abolitionist who believed in equality was a hard person to find. There were many people that were anti-slavery, but scared that free African Americans would scramble into northern cities and take jobs away from whites or overcrowd the urban areas. Discussions over slavery and emancipation were much more heated than people realize, and this movie clearly shows the divisions within Congress. Another problem that congressmen had with emancipation was the fear of having to enfranchise African American males, and that it would lead to enfranchising women. In my last video, I talked about the rise of Confederate women, and in it, I talked about how Northern women linked up with abolitionists to fight slavery and move towards suffrage for both African Americans and white women. And this scene shows that they were linked together in a common struggle. Gentlemen, I suggest you work some changes to your proposal before you give it to the president. We're eager to be on our way to Washington. Mr. Lincoln tell you to tell us this? It says securing peace for our two countries, and it goes on like that. I don't know what There's you're... just one country. You and I were citizens of that country. I'm fighting to protect it from armed rebels. From you. M Mr. Blair, he, he told us, he, you know, he told President Jefferson Davis that we were... A private citizen like Preston Blair can say what he pleases since he has no authority over anything. If you want to discuss peace with President Lincoln, consider revisions. If we're not to discuss the truce between warring nations, what in heaven's name can we discuss? In terms of surrender. One moment that I think gets little attention by reviewers is the scenes revolving the River Queen, where the Confederate Peace Commission meets with Grant and with Lincoln. It's an incredibly tense time. Lincoln had to make a decision, either to meet with the commission or not, but it was not simple. The war was coming to an end and peace would be coming. So Lincoln did not have to meet with them. But if he didn't, that would portray Lincoln as wanting the war to continue and not end the bloodshed as soon as possible. But he was also fighting against time, because if the war ended without the 13th Amendment being signed, then the likelihood of it passing with Confederate states rejoining the Union and reseating congressmen would be minuscule. We also get glimpses of Eli Parker, a Seneca Native American who was an engineer and acquainted with Grant before the war. And once he was turned down for army work, he contacted Grant, who made him an engineer in his army and later an adjutant, who traveled with Grant throughout the end of the war. Although he didn't have any speaking roles, the inclusion of Parker adds realism to the film. Here's a 16-year-old boy. We're going to hang him. For the 15th Indiana Cavalry near Beaufort, it seems he lamed his horse to avoid battle. I don't think even Stanton would complain if I pardoned him. You think Stanton would complain? I don't know, sir. I don't know who you're, uh, 
What time is it? It's 3.40 in the morning. Don't let him pardon any more deserters. <sighs> Mr. Stanton thinks you pardon too many. He's generally apoplectic mm -hmm. on the You oughtn't to have done that, crippled his horse. That was cruel, but you don't just hang a 16-year-old boy for Ask that. Ask the horse what he thinks. Cruelty, there'd be no 16-year-old boys left. John Hay and John Nicolay had to share a room because of the budget, and so seeing them in the same room sleeping got a pop out of me for historical accuracy. In this short scene, Lincoln is contemplating pardoning a 16-year-old boy who lamed his horse to avoid fighting. And he makes the comment that if he did not pardon him and others like him, there would be no 16-year-old boys left. His Secretary of War disagreed with the pardoning of deserters, but Lincoln felt for them and had sympathy, especially in the late stages of the war. Can we choose to be born? I don't suppose so. Are we fitted to the times we're born into? Well, I don't know about myself. You may be, sir, fitted. What do you reckon? Well, I'm an engineer. I reckon there's machinery, but no one's done the fitting. You're an engineer. You must know Euclid's axioms and common notions. I must have in school, but uh, <laughs> I never had much of schooling. But I read Euclid in an old book I borrowed. Little enough ever found its way in here, but once learned, it stayed learned. Euclid's first common notion is this. Things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. That's a rule of mathematical reasoning. It's true because it works. Has done and always will do. In his book, hmm, Euclid says this is self-evident. You see, there it is, even in that 2,000-year-old book of mechanical law, it is a self-evident truth that things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. We begin with equality. That's the origin, isn't it? That balance, that's, that's fairness. That's justice. This scene could be written off as inconsequential if one does not realize the evolution of Abraham Lincoln's religious thoughts. In his youth, Lincoln would be categorized as a deist. As a young lad, after church, he would gather the children around a stump and regurgitate the preacher's sermon and perform it in funny ways to get a laugh out of the youthful crowd. All to the consternation of his father, Thomas Lincoln. Let's just say he was not a churchgoer, but as the war progressed, Historians have pointed out that his attitude toward religion changed. He became more Calvinistic, believing that he was an instrument of God, and that the war itself was a punishment on the country for the sin of slavery. So he does change from being a deist as a young man to believing that God had a hand in the lives of people by the end of his life. Also, in this scene, he talks about Euclid's geometry, which he taught to himself, having the equivalent of only one year of schooling. An Easter egg that I do not believe was unintentional was the map of Kentucky behind him, the state of his birth. Do you or do you not hold that the precept that all men are created equal is meant literally? Is that not the true purpose of the amendment? To promote your ultimate and ardent dream to elevate- The true purpose of the amendment, Mr. Wood, you perfectly named, brainless, obstructive object. Now you have always insisted, Mr. Stevens, that Negroes are the same as white men are. The true purpose of the amendment, I don't hold with equality in all things, only with equality before the law and nothing more. That's not so. You believe that Negroes are entirely equal to white men. You've said it a thousand for shame, times. For shame! Stop prevaricating and answer, Representative Wood. 
I don't hold with equality in all things, only with equality After before the, the decades law, and nothing more. Of advocacy He's answered your questions. This amendment's not to do with race equality. This is a key moment where Thaddeus Stevens states that the 13th Amendment did not declare the equality of the races, but of equality of the races under the law. This is important because just because someone is anti-slavery does not mean in the least that they were for equality like Stevens was. Morning, Jim. Hello, Mr. President. Good to see you again. Well, boys, first question. You getting enough to eat? Good, sir. What's your name, soldier? Robert. Robert, good to meet you, Robert. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Kevin. Tell me your names to go past. I'd like to know who I'm talking to, Kevin. Mr. President, John. John, I've seen you before. Mr. President. Make sure you get some steak. I wouldn't mind. It's a simple moment, but Lincoln visiting the Army Hospital in Washington depicts a common occurrence. He enjoyed talking with the soldiers and letting them know that he appreciated their sacrifice. We see later in the movie that Lincoln visits Petersburg and Richmond after Robert E. Lee evacuates the city. But Lincoln would visit an Army Hospital on his trip where both Union and Confederate soldiers were cared for, and he made no distinction between the two. He talked with one as he would the other. Uh I have to do this, and I will do it, and I don't need your permission to enlist. That same speech has been made by how many sons and how many fathers since the war began? I, I don't need your damn permission, you miserable old goat. I'm going to enlist anyhow. And what wouldn't those numberless fathers have given to be able to say to their sons as I now say to mine, I'm commander-in-chief. So in point of fact, without my permission, you ain't enlisting in nothing, nowhere, young man. It's mama you're scared of. It's not me getting killed. I have to do this, and I will, or I will feel ashamed of myself for the rest of my life. Whether or not you fought is what's going to matter, and not just to other people, but to myself. Lincoln obviously had a strained relationship with his oldest child, Robert. During his son's early years, Lincoln was not a loving father, and he was away a lot, riding the circuit as a lawyer. It wasn't until his son Eddie passed away that Lincoln became more of an attentive father. But by that time, the division between himself and Robert had been established. Scenes like this one make Lincoln human instead of this mythic figure, and I appreciate that portrayal in this film. Once he surrenders, send his boys back to their homes, their farms, their shops. Yes, sir. As we discussed. Liberality all around, not punishment. I don't want that. And the leaders, Jeff and the rest of them, they escape, leave the country while my back's turned, that wouldn't upset me none. When peace comes, it mustn't just be hangings. The sit-down between Grant and Lincoln speaks to the president's constant emphasis on reconciliation. He wanted to bring the South back into the Union as painlessly as possible. He knew that the war and the Emancipation Proclamation had angered the South, and he took steps to mitigate the foreseeable problems. To help the transition away from a slave society, Lincoln would set up the Freedmen's Bureau, which not only helped newly freed African Americans, but also helped displaced whites who were victims of the war. He did not want Confederate leaders rounded up and executed for committing treason, as indicated by the comment in this dialogue that he wouldn't mind if they fled the country when his back was turned. His goal was to get the country back together under the new laws outlawing slavery that had been passed. I did say some colored men, the intelligent, the educated, and the veterans, I qualified it. Mr. Stevens is furious. He wants to know why you qualified it. No one heard the intelligent or the educated part. All they heard was the first time any president has ever made mention of Negro voting. Still, I wish I would mentioned it in a better speech. Mr. Stevens also wants to know why you didn't make a better speech. <laughs> This is one of the last scenes in the movie, but unless you pay attention, you may not catch exactly what they are talking about. The last speech that Abraham Lincoln ever made was on April 11, 1865. It was fairly brief, but it had incredible content. Within it, he toyed with the idea of giving voting rights to African Americans, but not all of them. As the scene depicts, he suggested those rights for the educated and veterans, 
This was revolutionary, but Lincoln would not be able to implement or fight for this right for African Americans himself because he would be killed a few days later. Thank you all for watching and being patient for this second part. Please check out my other videos and share them with your friends so the channel can grow. Thank you again and have a great day.